Many people played a role in the civil rights movement in Anniston. Some played very visible roles, while others were behind the scenes. It took both, and in one way or another, they all left their legacy, their mark, not only on Anniston, but on the nation. So many are no longer here to share their stories, and while their voices may be silenced, they are very much alive in the memories of others for what they accomplished. This is their story, as much as the story of those who appear here. Nestled in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, natural beauty surrounds Anniston like regal vestments. Anniston, from the beginning, appeared an idyllic community. Careful planning earned it the designation of Model City. Its founders, the Tyler and Noble families, sought to develop a community that would provide a good life for its residents. The foundation was laid on a sense of pioneering spirit and civic pride. It took little time for Anniston to become the business and cultural hub of the region. By 1890, it was the fifth largest city in Alabama. The story of the struggle for equal rights and full citizenship did not start in the 1950s and 60s. The story goes back to a much earlier time. Following the Civil War, the South had reached resegregation by the turn of the century. Anniston was no different. It was very much two worlds existing side by side. That included the school systems. Calhoun County Training School, formerly known as Hobson City Oxford Academy, was organized by Professor C.E. Hanna in 1905. My brother and I would get up like at four o'clock in the morning and we would ride with my father down to Oxford and uh, we walk from there to up to the county training school. Some days it was very cold and county training school, well, Hobson City had no paved streets. So you had to walk on those rocks, it was so rocky, and we wore out more shoes. And I remember my father saying, I'm gonna have to buy you some brogans, and I still don't know what he meant. But I, I, I take it that he meant shoes that was very, very rough, you know, that I could. But anyway, we, uh, we did that. And sometimes the train would be across the track. And I think about all the, 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 the things that we went through that was so, um, right now, dangerous. The train would be across the track and we thought we were gonna be late for school. And we would climb under that train. And, uh, so we could get be, be at school on time. This school received statewide recognition for its handcraft and manual training projects and reached a peak enrollment of 875 students. My brother graduated valedictorian, perfect attendance. I, the three years after that, I was perfect attendance and valedictorian of my class. My brother went into the Navy so that my mom could send me to school, have money to send me to school. <clears throat> and um, I went to, I had a scholarship to Alabama State University. And that's where I went to school. And it was at that time as Alabama State Teachers College. Later Cobb became Anniston School for black students. It was more than just a school. It was part of the fabric of the black community. At Cobb High, it was more or less like a big family. Even though you had a school from the 7th to the 12th, you had some like over 1,000 kids. But you knew the teachers, they was in the community, you know, and the teachers were more concerned, I think, back then. And good parental support along with the teachers if you act up at school, you didn't want to go home. You want the teacher or the principal to whoop you at the school. You didn't want to say, no, nah, send me home. No. That was unheard of. 
unless you really done something bad to get sent home. And they had activity that the school, it was close. Everybody knew everybody in the community. And Carl was known for the great athletic program we had. When uh, I got big enough and got far enough in high school, I played football. Well, the football did the jerseys and the pants was, came from Anderson High School. Stuff that they were throwing away, they brought it to Cobb. And that's what we played in, shoes, uh, socks, the jerseys, the pants, the shoulder pad, hip pad, uh, uh, rear pad, all of that. They would bring it over there in a big old pasteboard box and you would go through there and find out what you, what you could wear. And I played, when I graduated in 57, I was playing in what they call a Notre Dame helmet. Had no chin strap, fit tight. And that's what I played in uh, 54, 55, 56, that Notre Dame helmet. And those uh, the white boys sometimes would come over when uh, you'd be practicing. They would come over there and say, uh, "Don't tear my shirt up. Those my pants you got on." And you know, and we playing football, we had to put up with all of that in order just to play football because everybody, the guys, loved to play football. We had winning teams like that, and we minded, but there was nothing we could do about it. As the Civil Rights Movement began, Anniston appeared on the surface just another quiet little city. Underneath the surface, though, it was not so quiet. The color of skin dictated the rules of life. Uh, I can remember um, Ezell Park. When the kids, was white kids, was out there playing little football, little league football. And we would drive by, and they were about my age. And I said, Dad, them kids slow. I said, shoot, I get out there, I run a thousand touchdowns over them. And he would just laugh and say, well, son, uh, you know, uh, we can't go over there and play. Uh, and then they had their swimming pool over there. And you know, and I, you know, you couldn't go to the swimming pool, you couldn't play in the park, and so that coming up, you know, that you, know, it sort of remember things like that. When you got on the bus, you know, to go to the back. Well, for us, everything was the back. Even when we went to the movie theater, we went downtown to Ritz and the Calhoun. Okay, you go upstairs. We had to go upstairs. And the wife sit down there. But to me, I thought up was a better seat. <laughs> but that's just the way it was. We used to go to the movie on Saturday. It was, you took three, three bread wrappers and you could get in free. And we had to sit up, up stairs in the back of there. That's where we sit at. I've known them to say, you know, it's not open today for blacks, but it was open for white. Go, and that was you couldn't go. You know, you had nowhere to go. But you could always, when it was open, could always go upstairs in the movie. And at one time, it was a little more to go upstairs than it was to sit downstairs. And when we had to go to restaurants, you know, you had to go to the back door to order food. And instead of going in, sitting down and eating, um, and I, you can work in the restaurants, uh, but they wouldn't want to serve you as far as coming out and sitting out and taking your families out. Why would you eat a man cooking if you don't want him to sit down and eat with you? But they would let you cook, serve, couldn't wait tables. Now, you could bust tables after they get through eating, but you couldn't wait on them. Very few they would allow 
to wait on table then. You had to be well educated, to even go out there with manable dress, yes, no. And then some of them, <clears throat> excuse me, some of them talked to you like you wasn't human, but you had to stand there and take that. You didn't have no rights of the wood. I remember when Jack's hamburger place came into town. We weren't allowed to go to Jack's because of the fact that uh, blacks had to uh, go around to the side window to make their order. We were never allowed to go there. And, and even to this day, that sticks with me a little bit. Back in the 50s and 60s, it was just hard on black folk for some reason or another. You walked in the coat house, you couldn't drink water out of a one fountain. It wasn't worth drinking out of. You didn't want to drink out of it, and they, but they wanted us to drink out of it. You know, if you used the restroom or if you drank water away from home, you had to do it at a colored fountain or you had to go to a colored, dilapidated bathroom or whatever. I learned to control my movements and not go <laughs> because I had parents who almost made you do that because they didn't want you to experience this. You know, like I said, the water fountain, if you stopped in one of those places, don't dare look. I always ask mom about, you know, the water fountain. My mom always got to have the color water. You know, because that was a discussion in school. You ain't got no white water yet. No, mom won't let me drink no white water. So we always got to drink that color water. Cresses was a five and 10 cent store. And you could see from the back of Cresses to the front, and the manager used to stand on the side. I would organize me a group of our classmates going to South Anderson where we'd walk and should be riding a bus, and some adults would see us, and before we got home, we'd be in trouble. So I'd say, we're gonna stop in Cresses and we're gonna drink water. We're gonna line up, go like soldiers. You can't buy anything even if you have money, no, because you cannot let them stop and say we're stealing anything. We're gonna drink from the white fountain, and then we're gonna walk on back through like soldiers. We did that several times, and they would say, what are we gonna do if they stop us and say, I said, I'm gonna talk, let me say. They said, well, what are you gonna say? I said, I'm gonna say this simple. We're thirsty, we wanted water, and colored water is Kool-Aid that our mom make at home, and we didn't want Kool-Aid today, we just wanted water, and it said white, and we knew that was clear. There were two Anistons one for whites and one for blacks. For most whites, life was not that bad. For many blacks, it was a life of forced inferiority dominated by others. Quite naturally, to go to the doctor meant that you had to go to a different waiting room. And when I said different, there was a colored waiting room and then there was a white a tremendous difference in the sitting area. Uh, I wanted my children, when they were born, to be sure that they were healthy. And because of that, I, we needed a doctor. And not that the doctor was great, and I'm not gonna call his name, but he was, he was a very good doctor. And I think it was because of the times that you were put in an area where you felt that you were not as good as. And I never wanted my children to think that they were not as good as anybody else. They were not as clean as anybody else. They were as intelligent as anybody else. But to be put in a room with no TV, very few little toys or magazines for them to play with, but that was a transition. The doctor had built a new facility. And it just so happened when they moved into the new facility, there was not a black or colored waiting area. But they put us in the hall to wait. And my children were pretty much old enough then to want to go out and get those other toys that they saw other children playing with. And it would make you I want to cry when you think about that. And it was the times, and I'm just putting it on how the times were during that particular time. I'm glad they didn't grow up 
to think that they were not as good. Uh, they were not as clean. Uh, they were not able to do what others could do. But the doctor made no difference, I don't think, in how he treated the children compared to the white children. But that experience will stay with me. I like the doctor, but I think it was just because of the times. I want to think that. Oh, uh, when I went to the hospital, they had only a ward for black people. And it was a big, big ward. And most of the black people was in that ward. No white people was in that ward, only black people. When you came downtown, you couldn't sit at the counter at Crest's and none of those places. And the YMCA was there, but we had to walk fast by the YMCA. We weren't allowed to go into the Y. And that's not the only place, there were quite a few other places. And said, you know, white only. And that's what it was like during the early 60s until the movement took place. You see, we always had the Jim Crow laws. And that was just, for us growing up, that was just a part of life. You just knew you weren't supposed to do certain things. You couldn't go, you weren't supposed to go to a white person's front door. And you were supposed to say, uh, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, and you know, be respectful. Well, that, some of it was just good manners, you know. And uh, you would go to the, uh, Wherever you went, you know, if it was public, you had the white restrooms and the colored restrooms, the colored water and the white water, that kind of thing. My cousin who was, oh, maybe 15 years older than I am, he got me, we went to Lincoln or Riverside to Red Fish Art down there. And they had a place for black folks to go to the back. And they said, some of you stay in your car, they said, I want to take your order. If you got out and eat, they had some picnic tables for you. But the picnic tables is right here. Right here is an outdoor toilet. On that same concrete slab that they built the toilets on, they set the picnic tables on there for us to eat. Right? I'm saying a toilet that you don't flush. Right outside the outside toilet. And my daddy took me there. And we couldn't get out. We get the food, roll the windows up and eat, and then the car uh, a ride off. Because we couldn't go in there. EC, my cousin, said, we going in there. We walked in there one night and sit at the counter. First thing, and EC, I was much smaller than but EC is big, as big as I am now, so I know we were seen. <laughs> uh, we was ignored. Think we might get up and leave. But when the manager, I think was the manager, came to us on the other side of the counter where we were sitting, he didn't say hello. Uh, may I help you? He said, we don't serve niggas in here. The first words he said, the only words he said, we don't serve niggas in here. My heart started beating because I know it's on now. And my cousin who talked real slow, he said to that man, that's good, because we don't eat niggas. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good that you don't serve them. We ain't got no problem with that. Even in, in the Air Force, and I'm overseas, there were several areas where a black GI wasn't allowed. Uh, and I don't know if it was because of just the way things were when, when, when everybody else got there and, and, and they didn't want to change them. But there were certain areas, in, in, even in like Japan, for instance. I spent two years over there. There were certain areas, certain places that a black GI just didn't go. 
and uh, the same for the whites. They didn't, co they didn't come in certain areas. And it was just, I guess it was just the culture of the time. It would not stay that way. Two cultures were moving side by side toward an explosive date with destiny. Change moved across the South and the movement gathered momentum, a little here, a little there. That change would not come easily and without violence. While one group marched, determined to change society, another group was equally determined to resist change, using whatever methods worked, fear, intimidation, and violence. Well, at the time of that, this all took place, uh, my brother had got killed in Birmingham, so we left and went there, and on the way back, I blew a muffler, knocked the muffler off the car. So in order to get it fixed, I pulled in here in a service station there and to see about getting it welded back on. And when I went in, that's where it all started happening at. They didn't ask no question, they just started fighting right there. I never had nothing like that to happen. You walk in a place trying to get help, and all at once, Four or five people started beating on you, didn't even speak, just started beating on you. And the Lord just had that chain, they don't tell them what they did to her. If that piece of chain hadn't been laying there for me to pick up, you know, I got back to the car, they, they were going to tear the car up, but uh, they didn't know I had a gun in the car, but it wasn't loaded. But you know, when you see a gun, you automatically going to run away. They run back, he got a gun, he got a gun, they run. Went to the police station. They said there wasn't nothing they could do about it. Left, went home. They continued to follow me home. And uh, I went in the house, and me and the wife had a round because I got my gun then. And I'm not lying, I went, got my gun, I went back. And that's where it all took down, went down there. Then the police could help. But that's what made me mad. They said there well, wasn't nothing they could do about them jumping on us. But the minute I retaliated, they put us in jail. And uh, then the NAACP all and got involved in it. And lawyers come in out of town. They had to send for them. And I was treated pretty cruel in the courthouse. So my lawyer finally got with the district attorney and got them where I wouldn't have to come back in there no more unless it was absolutely necessary. Because the old judge, he wanted to send me down the road quick, fast, and in a hurry. But uh, I had some good lawyers, real good. And the they worked with the district attorney and got me off from my, that, all them charges. So it, they had wind up dropping all charges on me. Fear, intimidation, and violence had worked for a long time, but their power was no match for the ever-strengthening movement for civil rights. Not all white Southerners opposed change. Some showed remarkable courage. There was a man that all we ever knew his name was Red, simply because he had red hair and his skin was red but he was a very, very friendly young man at the time. This man owned what they called, they don't call it anymore, a service station. Because when you went there, he served you, he washed your windows, very friendly man. Uh, in fact, he, he gave credit to all of the people in my neighborhood, predominantly Afro-Americans. Well, this one afternoon, uh, our father called us and he said, don't go any farther than this, we were on the porch. And so it was about dust dark. Uh, we saw something burning. We didn't had, had no idea of what it was. And I guess my father did know. But he said, don't go outside of this porch. Then he finally told us, go inside. Well, we didn't know any different. The next day, the next morning, we found out. Of course, the service station was closed at the time. And the next morning, we found out that a cross had been burned in front of Red's